So now that we've given an example of how to create an effective visualization, let's give some examples about how to create an ineffective visualization. And so I've collected examples from other people who have collected examples of bad visualizations, and we'll talk through about what makes a bad visualization so that you can try to avoid that as well. Before we get into specific examples, let's talk about some overarching principles. So, try to avoid clutter. And oftentimes, when you have a lot of data and you run the default visualization, you get a lot of stuff. And that stuff may not all be important to the story that you want to tell. And part of telling a good story is the principle of less is more. And as you remove or de-emphasize aspects of your data, you may be able to draw the reader's eye to what's actually important. Because you'll have to display a legend, and that legend should make sense. The order should correspond to, say, the average value of that category, or it should be chronological. Don't just order alphabetically, which is a reasonable default that your plotting software will do, because it doesn't know any better. Make sure that you enable the reader to make comparisons, so your reader will want to know the difference between A and B. So be able to highlight the different things that they should be comparing. So use different shapes, use different colors, use different lines. All of these things together to make sure that the reader can make comparisons between various things that they may want to compare. And those things may not correspond to what you want to compare. You may be trying to introduce some new model, and you want to show that that model is great, but maybe you're comparing it against Sarah's model, and Sarah will want to be able to compare her model to all of the other models you ran to see how her model did. So make sure that you enable these comparisons. And also, think about the different ways that your visualization will be consumed. And so not everyone will view it on, say, a huge screen monitor, People may be viewing it on a smartphone, they may print it out on a black and white printer. Make sure that your visualization will work in all of those formats as best as possible. So before I talked about the quantity of data, there's also how many things you can put inside a single plot. And again, often less is more. Don't try to tell all of the stories that you want to tell with your data set in a single plot. Sometimes you'll want to use different plots to tell different stories, and that's fine and that's often good. So use your plots judiciously to tell a story, and you may want to go from one plot to the next to tell an effective story rather than trying to cram everything into a single plot. So now let's take a look at some examples of what not to do when you're visualizing data. So here is a plot that doesn't have a lot of information. They chose a reasonable default for x-axes and y-axes, so something that goes between 0 and 1. And, and that's often very reasonable. Those could be probabilities, for instance. But all the data is down here in the corner. Are there significant differences? Is there a trend in these data? It's impossible to tell. And so because the axes are way too large for what the actual data are, it's impossible to understand what's going on here. You can also err in the opposite direction. And so you might be cutting your y-axis too much so that it looks like there is a huge jump from point A to point B, when if you look at the y-axis, there is a much smaller jump than what you would believe if you just looked at the size of these bars. There is a trade-off here, and you can go too far in either direction. So try to be reasonable, and if you do truncate the y-axis where it doesn't start from zero, do so in a way that is very clear. And so make sure that if you have a non-zero y-axis, explicitly state that it's starting at such and such value. And if you're going to make comparisons over time, so for example on the x-axis, make sure that you have enough points of comparison. So for this graph, you may want to go further back in time. So like, go back decades, like, to the Reagan tax cut, and show the fluctuation of the tax rate over time to show how this trend fits in with the overall trend, rather than just looking at essentially two data points. 
So take a look at this graph, and if you just looked at the title of this visualization, you might believe that this is trying to tell you a story about how much various governors make in individual states. One problem about this, though, is that's not the easiest thing to see. What this visualization conveys very clearly is that there are more Republican governors than Democratic governors, and there's only one independent governor. That's interesting, but that's not what this visualization is trying to convey. It's trying to convey something about salaries. But to understand the salaries, you actually have to read numbers. And one diagnostic for if you have a bad visualization is if you threw in random information to the thing that you care about, would your visualization look different? And in this case, it wouldn't look different. You would still have exactly the same colors, exactly the same text, perhaps showing different numbers, but if you had random salary information, nothing would substantially change. So this isn't allowing comparisons between different states easily. And so, for example, let's say that I'm from Colorado, and I want to know who makes more than Hickenlooper, and who makes less than Hickenlooper. It's very difficult for me to see that easily. So if you did something like shading the state based on how much the governor was paid, it would be easier to see which are the highly paid governors and which are the less well-paid governors. So again, you want to enable comparisons. And so here you have a graphic that's trying to show that trade between China and Taiwan is different than trade between China and the United States. But what makes this really difficult is that the colors are inconsistent from one side to another, the y-axes are not comparable, and so there is some valuable information here, but this visualization doesn't help you get there. And so you need to translate the y-axis, you need to flip the colors, and then you can understand what's going on. If anything, this visualization hurts you in trying to come to the right conclusion about what's the difference between trade between China and the U.S. and trade between Taiwan and the U.S. So here's a visualization that's trying to show how various aspects of car properties correlate with each other. And here you have things like the weight of the car and the mileage, MPG, of a car are negatively correlated. The heavier your car is, the less mileage that it's going to get. You can see that by looking at this cell here. And so this makes sense. There's a negative correlation between the weight of the car and the mileage. But it's really hard to see the properties that correlate with each other. It's a mess of red and blue throughout this entire visualization. If you instead order your properties in a reasonable way, so for example, trying to put the things that have the highest correlations down here, and things with the lowest correlations in these two corners, you have a much better visualization that allows you to see what are the things that are positively correlated with each other. So for example, the turning radius and the displacement are positively correlated with each other. And things like weight and NPG are down in this corner where you have poorer correlations. So again, this is a place where the default ordering, for example, alphabetical order, doesn't quite work, but if you do something more logical, you can tell a much clearer story. To wrap up, often when you're working on a data science project, you will go through a number of steps, and this isn't really sequential, sometimes it's more of a cycle, you'll go back and forth, but let's treat it as an idealized sequence. You get some data, you wrangle it so that you get it into a clean format, then you do a visualization to explain to yourself what's going on with the data, is it possible to build a model on this data, what are the ranges and limits of the data that we have, and then you build some model, and then you want to use it for something in the world. 
And part of the process of using your data is explaining to someone else how your model works, how it will work on typical data, and that again requires visualization for you to do that. So you need visualization before you build the model so that you yourself can understand what's going on, and then you need visualization to tell the world what's going on and why your model worked well. And then, as I said, often this is a cycle, and so once you have a model, you get new data and the process starts from the very beginning. One thing that I want to emphasize is that copying is okay. And especially for visualizations, you'll see visualizations that look great, that do a good job of explaining what's going on. And it's perfectly okay to copy that. Uh, give attribution, uh, show where you got it from, but imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and you should use good aspects of visualization in your own work, and if you see something that's done really well, figure out how to replicate it with your own data and your own tools. So this was our very, very brief introduction to visualization. We'll be playing around with it in class and trying to interact with some data, and you'll be able to play around with your own data. And as we build models, we'll be using these sorts of visualizations to see how well these models are doing, and to figure out ways that we can improve our models.